glad to see everyone again. Uh, I'll be preaching tonight. Um, I thank Cor Brother Corbin for giving me the opportunity to preach. So we'll go ahead and jump into the message. In James chapter number 1, look down at verse 12. The Bible reads, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my br beloved brethren. And out there there's a quote, you probably have heard it before, uh, when someone's preached, not, you know, I've heard it in many different sermons. The quote says this, it says that because I don't know who originated it, but it says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you, would, you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And I think the portion in James that we're at illustrates that point. And I get my, the sermon title from that first point where it says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go. So that's the title of my sermon is, Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Now in James chapter number 1, verse 14, the Bible reads and says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we can see a cycle going on that... First, someone lusts after something, they have desire for something, and then that eventually can equate to sin, and then that eventually can lead into death. Now, the thing is, is that sin is not something that we should play around with. Sin is something that we should take seriously, and the Bible emphasizes that. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs 14, 9, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. So, we shouldn't just take sin lightly, and, you know, when people do sins, yeah, I, I will say that there are smaller sins and bigger sins, but in the end, we shouldn't take the smaller sins and think, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal, because what can end up happening is these smaller sins will end up leading you into bigger sins, and that's more or less the theme of my message. Now, it says in Proverbs 6, verse 27, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. So if someone thinks they can play around with sin, it's the same thing of thinking that you can take fire in your bosom or in your chest and not being burned by it, by that, that fire, or going and walking on hot coals and not being burnt by on your feet. So pe people who think that, you know, you can just do sin and get away with it and it's not that big of a deal, they just don't read the Bible and they have the wrong attitude because sin is not something you can play around with. And like I said, when you start doing one little sin, it can start leading into bigger sins and even greater sins. And we'll see some examples of that tonight. Now go with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. 1 Samuel 13, and while you're turning there, just the thought of, for instance, if you, uh, the Bible says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after have heard from the truth and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So people who love money they end up getting into all different types of sins. And it may start out, oh, well, I just like, I like to go gamble. But then that gambling can become an addiction where you just desire all this money and you desire, you get to the point where you get so greedy that you're willing to go and murder someone just to get some life insurance policy or get some money off of them. So it can lead you into to worse things. Now, where my first point comes in at, and we're going to do a little reading over the life of Saul, but my first point is this, is that disobedience will take you farther than you want to go. Disobedience will take you farther than you want to go. Because we may think disobedience is a small sin. Well, you know, I may not listen to my parents. It's not that big of a deal. Or my boss tells me to do something at work and I don't listen to the boss. It's not that big of a deal. Or the Bible tells me to do something. And I'm just like, yeah, I'll do it when I feel like it. You know, disobedience in God's eyes is a big sin, and we're going to see that here in the life of Saul and how that disobedience can lead into greater sins. It says in 1 Samuel 13, 6, and just to bring you up to speed of what's going on in the story, is that the children of Israel are going to fight against the Philistines. And uh, we'll start off in verse 6 because that will get most of it in context. But it says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went 
over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gil Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. So let's just explain what's going on is that, like I said, they're going to battle with the Philistines. And Samuel says, hey, I'm going to meet you in a few days, or I'm going to meet you at a point in time. Samuel ends up taking too long, so Saul takes it among himself to end up getting a peace offering and a burnt sacrifice and ending up burning that sacrifice, even though he was not supposed to do it. The reason why he was waiting on Saul, or sorry, Saul was waiting on Samuel, was that Samuel was the priest and he was supposed to be the one to do it. So look at verse 10. It says, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. So, Saul's trying to make it seem like he didn't really have to do this. But we can see he's saying he, he, he just did it anyway because he's just like, well, it took Saul, Samuel too long to come. But he's making it, trying to appear and making up excuses, saying, well, I had to force myself to do it. I wasn't going to do it, but I, I, I'm going to force myself to do, do this, even though it's wrong, even though I know I wasn't supposed to do it. Well, look at verse 13. It says, and, Saul, or sorry, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would God have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And why I bring this up is this is the first time we see Saul being disobedient to, to God's word. God tells him to do something. The man of God says, hey, just wait. Don't offer a back, uh, burnt sacrifice. He ends up doing it. He's disobedient to what God said. And at this point, God was just like, yeah, this guy is not fit to be king. I need to find someone else. And I think one key thing I thought was interesting when I was reading this, he said, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. And who knows if Saul was obedient to God's word, maybe, you know, Jesus would have came out of the tribe of Benjamin. We don't know. But he's saying that he was going to establish the kingdom forever. But since he was disobedient, he ended up losing that blessing from God. Now go with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 15, because like I said, this is more or less the first time we can see God, or sorry, Samuel being, or I keep saying the wrong person. I keep mixing up Samuel and Saul. We see Saul being disobedient to God, but this happens often, or in his life a lot. And we'll see here the more familiar passage, the more famous passage in 1 Samuel 15, where it says in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, slay, but slay both Man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So what's going on is that God tells Sam, uh, Saul to smite or to kill all the men of Amalek and everyone in Amalek. Because what happened, if you read the book of Exodus, when the children were leaving, the children of Israel were leaving Exodus, they ended up, Amalek ended up fighting them for some reason. And they ended up winning that battle, but I guess God just was like, these people are so wicked that when I get a chance, I'm going to end up destroying them. So this was the chance, and God was gracious enough to give Saul that opportunity to be the person who executes his judgment on the children of, or on Amalek. But it's, and we'll keep going on the story. Look at, look down to verse 7. It says this, and salt, and, and small smote the Amalekites from Havil, or Havila. Until thou camest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep 
and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them but everything that was vile and ref refuse that they destroyed utterly then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments and it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. So what ends up happening is that Saul doesn't do everything that God tells him to do. God says smite everything. He says kill, you know, man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, ass, sheep, everything. He said destroy them utterly. But Saul and the people that were with him did not do that. They kept Agag, the king, alive for some reason. They kept all the sheep. Everything that they saw that was good, that they th thought that they could keep for themselves, they refused to destroy it. So God sees this, and God's not happy. And he's, at this point, he's just like, I don't want to have anything to do with Saul. Look down at verse 13. It says, and, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So did when Samuel comes, Saul is like, yeah, I did everything that you told me to do. But did he really? No. You know, he kept all the good stuff for himself. He kept the sheep. He kept, he even spared Agag. And it says this, and Samuel said, what meaneth the bleeding, this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the ox in which I hear? So Samuel's calling him out on his lie, saying that, hey, you didn't really actually kill and execute judgment like God told you to do. And Saul said in verse 15, and Saul said that they have brought they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So let's break this down, because if you remember back in verse nine, what does it say? But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, of the fatling and of the lambs and so on and so forth. So. Saul and the people it wasn't Samuel's trying to first he's being disobedient now he gets into another sin of making all these excuses and lying saying well it wasn't actually me it was actually the people that did it and then on top of that he ends up becoming delusional God tells him to destroy everything but then he does it and he's saying well we spared all the stuff for you so that we could sacrifice it onto God that's the only reason why we did it and then everything else we destroyed that's not what God told him to do. God said destroy everything of the Amalekites, and he didn't end up doing it. So we can see that his, just that small sin of disobedience ended up just leading into other sins. He starts lying. He starts becoming delusional. And look down at verse 16. It says this, Then Samuel said unto, the, unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? <clears throat> It says in verse 20, and Samuel said on, or sorry, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So Samuel is pretty much saying, you didn't do everything God told you to do. And then Saul is just still making up excuses, saying, well, I did keep what, you know, th th I did obey what God told me to do. And it's, it's the people's fault. And we didn't, you know, he's making up all these excuses that he doesn't need to make. Well, let's see what Samuel says, because he's speaking, I believe he's speaking from, you know, like uh, speaking from what God is trying to say to Saul. But he says this. In verse 22, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, 
he hath also rejected thee from being king. So Samuel calls him out and he says that God doesn't want to have anything to do with you. And then we know later on David ends up being ordained. So you could say, well, that's not that big of a deal. He was disobedient for a little bit. He, you know, he just didn't fully execute what God told him to do. I don't see a, a, a big deal about that. Well, go, go to First Chronicles chapter number 10. Because you may not see it as a big deal of, oh, well, if you're being disobedient, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. You know, you, you'll do it whenever you want, or you can do it halfway. But no, you know, God wanted him to do it a certain way, and he didn't do it, and God ended up punishing him for it. Now, why have you turned to First Chron- Chronicles chapter number 10 is this, is that we know from the life of Saul that after this happened, God z- ends up having Samuel ordain David to be king or anoint him to be king. And then Saul ends up pretty much wanting to have David killed just to sum it all up. So he ended up chasing him in many different chapters, trying to kill him. He wasn't successful. He eventually like backed off. And then he ended up having to fight the Philistines. That's when he ended up going to a witch, asking the witch for counsel because God wouldn't talk to him anymore because God didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And then he ends up going into battle with the Philistines, commit suicide, and then that's the end of Saul. And he's pretty much a byword and a proverb until this day. But it says this because that's what sums up 1 Chronicles chapter number 10. But look at verse 13. In 1 Chronicles 10, 13, it says, So Saul died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. So we see the end result of Saul that God killed him. Why? Because he broke God's commandments. He didn't listen to God's word. He was being disobedient to God's word. So God let that end up, he ended up letting Saul die in battle because of that. But then look at the next part of that verse, and then it says this, and also asking for counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So God also punished Saul for asking counsel of a lady who has a familiar spirit, putting it in layman's terms, asking counsel for a woman who's a witch. And I'm sure throughout Saul's life, Saul didn't want to go and talk to a witch. As a matter of fact, if you read 1 Samuel 28, if I remember the chapter correctly, the lady says when he goes up to her to ask ask counsel of her, she says, when Saul, I hope, pretty much she says, I hope you're not Saul because, or I hope, you know, you got to be quiet if you're coming to me for counsel because Saul ended up killing all the witches and wizards and everything that was around. But why is the same person that's disobedient now getting into witchcraft? (laughs) He's getting in, he's asking counsel of a witch. Well, I believe that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And like I said, I don't think Saul was thinking that he was going to ever ask for counsel of a witch. But when he had that small sin of disobedience, that ended up leading him into greater sins. And it says this in verse 14. It says, And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom of God, kingdom, sorry, the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. I don't know why I said God, but the kingdom, I'm just so used to saying the kingdom of God, but and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. So we see that that was like the straw that both broke the camel's back and that God was like, like, I'm through with you. And he ends up letting Saul die. Now, that's my first point is that, yeah, when you're disobedient, you think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, it's going to lead you into greater sins. And with greater sins, there's going to come greater punishment from God. Now, what I want you to do is turn to Proverbs 13 for my second point. Proverbs 13. And when you, while you're turning there, the Bible says this, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So when you drink alcohol, that will take you farther than you want to go. People think that they can just play around with drinking, you know, with the sin of alcohol and say, oh, well, I like to eat or I like to drink alcohol while I eat a meal or something. Well, that's going to lead you into greater sins. And we can see that from the Bible here. Look down at Proverbs 23, 29. The Bible says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So we see that there's a time you're not supposed to look at wine, and it's when it's red, it moves itself, it giveth its color in the cup and it moveth itself aright. So I believe that's like the fermentation process where it becomes alcoholic. Well, what happens when you just partake in that alcohol? 
it's things start happening that you wouldn't normally do. It says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. You know, someone who's under the influence of alcohol or drugs, they're going to do stuff with women that they probably would not <laughs> normally do. You know, for instance, I'll use prostitution. I think any guy in his right mind isn't going to mess with a prostitute because prostitutes are filthy. If they're full of diseases. They're full of, they've been with so many people. It's a disgusting thing. But when you're under the influence of alcohol, you know what you'll do? You'll do that type of stuff. You're going to behold strange women. Not only that, you know, there's some people that they won't say things unless they're drunk. And that's why if you notice the next part of the verse, it says, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. When you're under the influence of alcohol, things that you wouldn't normally say to people, then you start saying it. And, you know, I'm not going to say any perverse things, but I'm just saying, you know, things, you can think of things that people are, would say, that would, you wouldn't say in front of children, you wouldn't say around other people, but when you're under the influence of alcohol, you're going to say those things. It says, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And that's the worst part about people who drink alcohol is that even though they go through all this stuff, they're having wounds without cause, they're babbling, they're going through, you know, they're getting in fights and then they feel sick, they have the hangover, they still go back to wine, which makes no sense. They go back to that strong drink, they go back to alcohol. Now go with me to Genesis chapter number 19, Genesis 19. So we could see in this passage in Proverbs 23 that when you get, when you become an alcoholic, when you start drinking alcohol, you think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. My friends are doing it. They invited me at a company function to go drink alcohol. Well, it's going to lead you into greater sins. You're going to behold strange women. You're going to utter perverse things. You're going to get in fights. You're going to, you know, have wounds that you don't even know where they came from. But not only that, it can go to even higher extreme. And we can see that here in the in Genesis 19 with the story of Lot. So God ends up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, and then pretty much Lot and his family think that they're the only people on this earth left. And it says this in verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, and he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto to the younger, our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after all manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. So we see in this passage that, like I said, they think his, for some reason his daughters think, I guess, I mean, anyone who sees fire falling from the sky and a city getting destroyed will probably think, <laughs> and they get away, they probably will think that they're the last people on earth. But they have this dumb, they think that they're the only people left on this earth. And they're like, well, we need to pretty much repopulate the, the earth. And instead of just waiting and then finding out that God didn't actually destroy the earth, they start being irrational. And what they end up doing is they end up getting their dad drunk. And they get him drunk, and then they end up lying with him. And I'm sure, because for instance, for, I mean, it says that they gave him wine. So they had to give him the wine, and he had to drink it. And he probably just didn't think. He was just like, well, I can drink the wine, and it's not that big of a deal. But I'm sure Lot didn't think he was going to sit there and sleep with his daughters. I'm sure that probably never crossed his mind ever in life. But when he was under the influence of alcohol, you know what happens? Things like that happen. It says in verse 34, And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also. And go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and, lie with, and lay with him. And he perceived not when she, lay, lay, eh, when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. So we see in this passage that it happens again. So he didn't learn his lesson the first time. And, he had, and obviously he didn't know because he was the un, under the influence. But when that paternity test came and then he found out he was the father of his own, you know, grandchildren, I know he was like, wow, this is weird. So... Things like that can happen when you drink wine. 
things like that can happen when you drink alcohol. You're like, well, you know, if I just drink a little alcohol, it's not that big of a deal. Nothing's going to happen. You know, I'll get home safely, so on and so forth. But then you end up getting into bigger sins. You end up committing incest. You end up committing adultery. You end up committing other sins that you didn't even think you were capable of committing. But the only reason you're doing it is because you're letting that little slim sin slip past, thinking it's not that big of a deal. But then it, it ends up leading you into greater sins. Now, just an honorable mention, you don't have to turn here, but it says in Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So, same thing. You say, oh, it's not a big deal to drink alcohol. You let some weirdo at a party, a guy, give you alcohol. You end up getting drunk. Next thing you know, you've been raped by a guy. I mean, and it's happened before. I remember in... Um, like at some school in Georgia, it was UGA, they ended up, there was this guy, he would go to parties, he would get guys drunk, and then he would, you know, defile them. And the thing is, when a guy gets defiled, he doesn't really want to let anyone else know he got defiled. So they didn't really catch the guy for a long time just because none of the guys were brave enough to go and say, hey, this guy did this to me. And it can happen to anyone. You know, you, 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 you think, oh, if I just drink you know, just a little bit, a small shot, it's not that big of a deal. But then you have the, the possibility of getting, you know, defiled and molested and raped by someone else, especially we even see this warning in this passage where a man's giving another man drink so he can take advantage of him. So just saying that is that you shouldn't let the small sins and think, oh, well, if I just drink alcohol, it's not that big of a deal. Nothing's going to happen to me. No, it can lead you into greater sins and it can lead to greater consequences that you didn't even think would happen. Now, go with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 11. 2 Samuel chapter number 11. So, my first point was disobedience. As We may think it's a small sin, but it can lead us into greater sins, and it can make us do things that we didn't think we were going to do. Same with drinking alcohol. You know, we're in a society and a world where alcohol is like the most important thing to people's lives. I was on a call, I think yesterday at work, and they were just talking about, uh, you know, like Christmas and Christmas parties and all this stuff, and all they were talking about was just drinking alcohol. Or when you get, you know, if anyone who has a job or whatever, you'll, you do something nice for someone or you get something fixed for someone, then they'll say, hey, I'll buy you a beer. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's like, you know, especially with Habakkuk 2.15. But they say these things thinking that it's not that big of a deal, but you don't want those small things to creep in your life because you let those small things creep in your life, and then it's going to lead into bigger sins. And I even think this example is probably one of the a really important example because this happens all the time and my last point is this is just that fornicate fornication and adultery will take you farther than you want to go and the reason I bring up both is because both have can have a similar end, end result and uh, we'll see that in this passage because what's happening with David we you know if you're familiar with the story he ends up committing adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, but he ends up doing things that I'm sure in his mind he wasn't willing to do, and he didn't even think he was going to do, and we'll see that as we, as we read. Look down at verse 11, or sorry, at verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse 1. It says this, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah, and David tarried still at Jerusalem. So David's supposed to be going out to battle. He hasn't, he hasn't ended up going. He ends up just staying behind, and he's, he ends up chilling out at his house or whatever. And it says this in verse 2, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from... The roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very fair sorry was very beautiful to look upon and David sent and inquired after the woman and said and and one said, "Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with and he lay with her, for she was purified." from her uncleanness and she returned unto her house and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said I am with child so what ends up happening is this is that David because he's not doing anything for some reason he ends up waking up 
pretty late at night. He sees a woman bathing. So the first sin he does, he ends up lusting after this woman who's bathing. He had all right to just go back in the house. He had all right to turn his head. And he, all, he even had wives. I mean, I think at this point he had two wives. Or no, actually, I think he had more than two wives because I think he had like five or six at this point in time, which, you know, polygamy is wrong. That's another sermon in and of itself. But he already had wives, but then he ends up seeing this woman bathing on this roof. He ends up lusting after the woman. So that's sin number one. And then he ends up inquiring. Some guys say, hey, this is Uriah the Hittite. And if you read the Bible, you know Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. If there's a list of like 30 or 35 different mighty men, and he's on that list. So he knows the guy who, whose wife he's lusting after. They tell him who she is, and he still doesn't care. He says, well, whatever. He ends up taking her, and she's in sin too, don't get me wrong, because he ends up taking her. She should have said no. But he ends up taking her, he lies with her, and then she ends up conceiving. So he's already committed two sins. He lusted, and then after he lusted, what did he do? He ended up committing adultery, because this lady was clearly a married woman. He knew who the, the husband was, but he didn't really care. And that's what happens sometimes when, you know, men, we as men, you have some wandering eyes or whatever. And that wandering eye can end up causing you to commit adultery, especially for those who are married. People who are not married, it can end up causing you to commit fornication. And we see that even happen with David. He had all right, like I said, to turn around, get back in the house, go, you know, do something else. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't think of anything. But he had all right to do something else, but he decided not to. You know, he ended up... And then on top of not deciding not to look, he ended up just like making inquiry of the lady saying, oh, well, yeah, I know who she is. And then still committing the sin. And I'm sure in David's mind, he was probably like, hey, I'm a man. You know, I'm often called the man after God's own heart or after God's own heart. And, you know, I wouldn't commit adultery on someone. You know, I would commit adultery on a woman. But he ends up doing that because his lust ends up commit his his lust something that's a smaller sin ends up becoming a bigger sin. Now let's keep reading. Look down at verse 14. We'll just skip a few things. But just to bring you to explain what's going on while we skip those is that David ends up make once he gets her pregnant, then he's just like, you know, I'm in trouble now. So he tries to set up all these different plans to get Uriah to to try to make it look like it was actually Uriah's kid. And Uriah is a just man, so he doesn't really, because he's like such a loyal guy, none of his plans really work. So it gets to the point that David's just like, you know what, we just need to kill this guy. And David ends up putting him in the hardest, hottest part of a battle and letting him end up dying. And we'll see that in verse 14. It says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab and there fell some people, some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. So, we see that David ends up just setting up this plan where he says, pretty much put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle and then just withdraw the troops. And the plan ends up working so that he ends up, they fought, Joab ends up finding a city. The city's somewhere that he ends up wanting to fight the people. He fights the people and then some of the people end up dying in that battle and Uriah the Hittite was one of them. So now let's get on to the list of sins that David has committed just because he lusted. Because first what, David lusted, then he committed adultery, and then on top of that, he committed murder. So that small sin of lust ended up leading into a bigger sin of adultery, which that ended up leading into another big sin of murder. And I don't think David, you know, had Uriah on his hit list. I don't think David wanted to kill Uriah. I don't think that was his goal in life was to kill Uriah, but what did he end up doing? When he wanted to cover up all his sin, he ended up killing someone that was under him. He ended up killing one of his mighty men. And that's what I'm saying is that sin is going to take you farther than you want to go. You know, David just wanted to have a good time. He wanted to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but then he ended up committing murder. And then God held him accountable for this. You know, God punished him severely. The baby that they had in the adultery ended up dying. God didn't let the sword depart from his family. Many of his children ended up dying on top of that. So 
God punished him after this, this sin that he committed, but if he just didn't even commit the small sin of lust, then he wouldn't be, and then on top of that, committing adultery, then he wouldn't be getting into this greater sin of murder where God's going to have to punish him for it, even worse than just committing the lust. Now, look at verse 26. It says, And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And like I said, in the next chapter, which we're not going to go over tonight, but he ends up, uh, Nathan the prophet ends up calling him out for the sin that he did, and he ends up being killed for it, or not being killed for it, sorry, his baby ends up dying for it, and then God punishes him for the things that he's done. But like I said, that's the point with uh, adultery, but the same thing goes at fornication. And obviously fornication and adultery are two different things. Fornication happens when people, it's when people who are not married sleep together, but then adultery happens when people who are married end up sleeping with someone who they're not married to. So, any way it goes, we can see this in our society now. I remember watching or actually reading an article, and there's this guy, some news pundit, and he did like just some wicked thing, and they ended up firing him. And come to find out, the guy just had a really raunchy past. The guy ended up, I don't know if it was a woman he worked with, but pretty much he ended up committing adultery many times with this lady he worked with. On top of committing adultery with her, she ended up getting pregnant. And then he was just like, well, we need to abort the baby. And then she didn't want to have an abortion, so he ended up going to try. They ended up going to court and all this other stuff, and then he had to pay child support. But anyway, that didn't really have too much point of the sermon, but it happens in our society all the time with fornication and adultery. I mean, this pun news pundit that's committing adultery, he wants to kill this baby. So him already committing this bad sin of lust ended up leading into adultery because he was married, and then it ends up leading to abortion, which is murder. And same goes with fornication. That's why I think a lot of the liberals are pro-abortion is because they want to be able to do these wicked things and then have no consequences for it. And I think, like, for instance, this guy I'm talking about, he was a liberal news pundit. He was, he was you know, extremely liberal, and he's doing all these weird things behind the scene. And I thought to myself, I was like, this is probably why they promote abortion so much, is that they want to do just wicked things, and then they don't want to have any consequences for it. But the thing is, God will punish you regardless. Whether or not you make abortion legal or not, God's going to still punish you for the sins that you commit. And same with people that's committed abortion. I mean, it's murder. Let's just say it as it is. You know, people like to think that abortion isn't as big of a deal, but you're literally killing a baby. I mean, anyone who's like, especially, for instance, when my wife's pregnant, you'll see the baby kicking. I mean, you'll see the baby literally like kicking. Like, you'll see her stomach in one position, and then you'll just see it like tap out. And you're like, okay, that baby's alive and kicking. <laughs> so you know that a baby is alive. You know that it's not just some, you know, thing that, that doesn't have, you know it's alive. We'll just put it like that. You know it's just not some blastocyst or some creature that, that doesn't have life and soul. But these liberals want to do it. Why? They want to have abortions so that they can promote sin and let people commit adultery and then say, oh, well, you get, it, you get to get away with it. But no, that's not right. And like I said, Small sins will lead, or lead into bigger sins. I'm sure David in his head wasn't, he didn't want to commit murder. I'm sure he probably didn't even want to commit adultery, but he ended up doing it because he let that small sin end up snowballing into a bigger sin. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians 6, and when you get there, verse 15. Because like I said, yes, fornication and adultery are different, but they can both have the end result that if you get into a sin like that, a sin like fornication, a sin like adultery, you can become a murderer. You know, you're like, no, you, no, you can't. Yes, you can. We see David became a murderer. We see, you know, other people in the society become a murderer. So you get into sins like that and think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You're, you know, you can get, it can become a bigger sin than you think. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he 
which is joined to a harlot is one body. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not? That your body is the holy temple is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So we see here in this passage that the Bible is saying, "Flee fornication." And oftentimes you'll you'll hear people say, "Oh, well, if two people are consenting adults or consenting to it to to commit fornication. It's not that big of a deal." But like I said, you say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's going to lead you into a greater sin. You know, the lady gets pregnant. Oh, I don't want a kid anymore. I don't want a kid at all. And then what she end up doing? She has the sin of fornication, ends up becoming murder because she's just aborted her baby. So all that to say this is that you don't want to think that, you don't want to take small sins lightly. You, you know, like the title of the sermon is, sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin can take you into different things that you don't know you're going to commit. And you say, oh, I'll never commit, you know, murder. I'll never commit adultery. But then you lust, and it can lead into those things. And you need to be careful about that. You shouldn't take sin lightly and think that, oh, I can just get away with these sins, and it's not that big of a deal. You know, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not hurting, uh, you know, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's not that big of a deal. But it is a big deal. And, you know, you've got to look back when you're committing these bigger sins, and you'll be like, yeah, it was a big deal. I shouldn't have done this. You know, the quote again is this. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, it costs you more than you want to pay. And just think about that. You know, you don't want sin to rule your life. And you don't want the st sins that you don't think are a big deal to end up becoming a much bigger deal than they can be. And we could see from stories in the Bible that there are a lot of people who probably thought the sins that they committed weren't that big of a deal. But then they ended up becoming a bigger deal than we thought. So let's pray. Lord.